on the little Zoom link here. Look, welcome to, to everybody, to our panelists, to our audience. Um, I'm David Shrookman, I'm science editor of BBC News, and I'm meant to be across the news uh, about climate and energy, and I'm just kind of dizzy from trying to do that. I mean, just, I made a little list and I had to keep adding to it. You know, we've had the British Prime Minister tell the world last night at the UN General Assembly to grow up. Uh, we've had uh, in the last few days, the UN totting up the climate proposals from the countries that have submitted them so far. And that says that the emissions by 2030 are set to go up by 16%, not down by 45% that scientists say is necessary. Um, in an absolutely brilliant stroke of irony, uh, the UK hosting COP is actually short of carbon dioxide for its various industrial processes. I mean, that's one I think for, uh, for, for, for sort of comedians to take hold of and, and, and run with if it wasn't so funny, if it wasn't so serious. Uh, gas, uh, that's becoming is waiting for the world's biggest emitter, China, to come up with a bolder thing it's done so far. Uh, there's quite a diplomatic dispute with uh, the UK, Australia, America, and uh, nuclear submarines being the issue, and China being. Uh, uh, that, that was not the target for that, at least uh, in the frame for that. Um, yet at the same time, we've had China saying it's going to stop financing coal projects abroad uh, because people had worried that China wouldn't compartmentalize climate um, in its international um, relations. And to top it all, Kermit the Frog is now part of the climate narrative. So, I mean, there's, there's an extraordinary amount to discuss. Um, so look, welcome to this, uh, this event. It's part of the Environmental Frontline series brought to us by Frontline Online. Uh, that's hosted by Pranvera Smith. And this event is, uh, is, is brought together by Luke uh, Douglas Holm of uh, Clear Public Space. So thank you to both of you for organizing it all and bringing us together and, um, and getting hold of me. And I suddenly found a gap in the diary. So I'm very pleased to be able to do this. The basic format, we've got a fantastic panel. I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves, to have five minutes, just to set out their basic stall of, of, of the key issues as they see them, the topics that they think are most relevant for this evening's discussion all, of course, with COP26 uh, in mind, uh, now getting actually pretty close. It officially starts on October the 31st with the big Global Leaders Day on November the 1st. And looking at my diary this morning, I suddenly realized how, how, fastly, how fast that's um, approaching. Um, the theme of this evening, the, the heading, is radical action required. And uh, so I guess that's the overarching context for what we're, we're going to be discussing. That's certainly what the scientists of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have, have laid out, and it's what governments have been discussing uh, in recent weeks and certainly in the countdown to COP26. So look, in, in no particular order, but just the order that everyone's been listed, I'm going to invite Professor Paul Eakins of UCL. Paul, uh, the floor is yours, uh, five minutes, if that's okay. And um, we'll obviously be coming back to you during the course of the evening, but, but over to you, Paul. Well, thank you, David. And you've asked us to introduce ourselves. So as you said, I'm Paul Eakins. I'm professor of resources and environmental policy here at UCL. And I spend a lot of my academic life working on climate and energy issues. I'd like to go back a bit further, if I may, than, than your um, description to, to tell us how we got here and why radical action is not just required, but is absolutely imperative if we want a human civilization by the end of this century. Um, 2015 Paris Agreement, uh, the world agreed to keep global temperature rise well below two degrees centigrade and to 1.5 degrees centigrade if possible. We're already at 1.2, so there's not a little, there's not a lot of space. 
countries were asked to submit um, uh, contributions to that emission reductions. And so far, they've not submitted reductions and committed to reductions anything like enough to uh, hit either of those targets. Even if they meet all their uh, contributions, we're still headed for 2.7 degrees. And uh, there's a lot of doubt as to whether countries that are committed to net zero and all that stuff are actually going to meet that. In 2018, we had the IPCC special report on 1.5 that showed that the climate damage difference between 2 degrees and 1.5 was very substantial. And that uh, spurred the rhetorical commitments, at least, to a 1.5 degree target. On the other hand, in 2020, we saw UNEP's production gap report, which showed that countries and the fossil fuel industries within those countries are currently aiming to produce 120% more fossil fuels by 2030 than is consistent with 1.5 degrees. So we've got that huge paradoxical inconsistency right at the heart of all this climate rhetoric. The uh, IPCC's sixth assessment, the Physical Science Basis Report, was uh, published earlier this year, and it concluded more strongly than ever before that human-induced climate change is with us, and they've already seen changes in the atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, and biosphere, and observed changes in extremes, including heat waves, heavy precipitation, droughts, tropical cyclones, and um, uh, the attribution of human influence to these events. This shouldn't be a surprise because we've seen all this on our television screens uh, over the last six months in spades from many parts of the world, though we have to wait for a few more months for working group two of the IPCC to report on the impacts. Then the IEA published its net zero uh, emission scenario uh, earlier in July. And it said categorically that there is no need for investment in new fossil fuel supply, no new oil and gas fields, no new coal mines for a 1.5 degree C target. And finally, with my little historical roundup, earlier this month, uh, I and some colleagues at UCL published a paper in Nature that showed that uh, some uh, by 2050, some 56% of global gas reserves, 58% of global oil reserves, and 89% of global coal reserves will have to remain in the ground. And again, the paradox is that as soon as any country discovers these reserves, uh, it can't wait to extract them and pump the carbon into the air just as fast as possible. So um, we need uh, now, uh, and oh yes, and our scenario in that, uh, in that space showed oil and gas production globally must now decline by 3% per year, um, in order to meet the 1.5 degree target. And as David said right at the beginning, all the projections are that up to 2030, um, oil and gas uh, production and indeed carbon emissions are going to rise uh, substantially. Um, so uh, we need radical action both to constrict fossil fuel supply, and there are all sorts of interesting policy initiatives that we might like to discuss that might achieve that, and to reduce fossil fuel demand in every conceivable way. And the, um, the IEA said that uh, not only did we not need new coal, oil, and gas fields, but we did need massively increased investment in clean energy generation, network infrastructure, and end use sectors, meaning uh, the energy that is used by uh, industry and also the energy that is used by us in our homes and in our transport. So that's probably my five minutes, David, and um, uh, looking forward to getting into the kind of radical actions that will be required if we are to have a catch chance in hell of avoiding the worst of climate change. Paul, thank you very much indeed, both for keeping to time and for laying all that out so uh, with, with such commendable clarity. That's that's brilliant. Let's, let's move straight on to Shailaja Fennell. Um, from uh, the University of Cambridge. Uh, Challenger, over to you. Tell us your specialism, your interest in this area, and, and the floor is yours for, for five or so minutes. Thank you, David. So I'm Shailaja Fennell. I'm a reader in Regional Transformation Economic Security at the Department of Land Economy at the University of Cambridge. And my particular interest is in sustainable agriculture and its implications for sustainable land use. And today I'd like to give you a 
the issues of radical actions in land use, uh, because unless we manage our land better, uh, sustainable agriculture is going to be a very far-fetched uh, objective. So here are the killer facts. At the current rate, if we look at global waste, so it's not what we consume, it's what we throw away. Global waste, we know it was predicted as early as 2018 in the Waste 2.0 World Bank report, is expected to grow at 3.4 billion tons by 2050. And this is more than double the population growth over that same period. So if you like, we're gonna produce twice as much rubbish as human beings. That's quite a significant number. It's also the case that a greater amount of this waste is produced in high income countries and not in low income countries, but the recycling rates of waste, and you can only do three things with waste. You can recycle, you can incinerate, or you can put them in landfills. And I'm gonna talk about landfills first. In 2019, the evidence was that landfills released 15% of methane emissions. So they're not small fry, they're quite a significant player. That's the equivalent of about 21 million passenger cars driven in a year. And as I said, because the ability to recycle is higher in higher income countries, which do about a third, but it's much lower in the poorest countries, there's a bizarre trend of rubbish being traded to other parts of the world. And so till rather recently, high income countries of which the US is the biggest producer of waste and the UK, we're much smaller, but we're the second biggest producer of waste in the world, a lot of what we produce, we actually exported to other countries. Of this, the most important parts are the plastics and the cardboards and the other materials. In more recent years, countries have hit back. So China said in 2018, we're not going to accept any more of your plastic. This means that high income countries and therefore at COP26, there has to be a very honest conversation about how we're going to reduce plastics globally and associated with that, how we're going to trade more ethically, because otherwise what we're going to end up is simply moving around the waste rather than reducing the waste. Second, within each of these countries, including countries, for example, India, which recycles a very small part, less than 5% of its waste, at the rate it is producing waste, it will need another city of New Delhi by 2050 as a landfill, not as a city, as a landfill. And that is huge there. You know, so what we are saying is that the incentives are perverse, not only globally, but both in high income and low income countries. And particularly perverse is that a majority of the payment of waste treatment, be it landfill or incineration, or even the tiny bit recycled, is on the taxpayers costs. Very little is being done by industry. So one of the things that we really need to think about radical change is how globally do we make those accountable? I know we talk about, you know, having brown paper bags rather than plastic, but that's a tiny drop in the ocean. We need significant change in terms of how we manage waste if we are going to improve land use. And my final point is if this doesn't happen, very recent case that we saw in the British press, the case of quarries in Staffordshire, which were polluting to such an extent that a small child suffering from lung disease, his mother had to go to court to say his quality of life and his very life was threatened. If we think about how significant that is and the court ruled and the environmental authority was told it was not taking into regard one child's human rights. This extraordinary expansion in waste is going to affect the human rights of many children who are far less well placed, whose parents will not be able to go to court in societies that already have a huge number of childhood diseases. And if COP26 was supposed to be about one thing, it was supposed to be about strong sustainability. That's do no harm to the next generation. And I'm sorry if we don't take this seriously, we will be doing harm. Thank you very much, David, for my five minutes. Charlotte, thank you. Actually, I was still reeling from that stat about needing another New Delhi just for landfill. <laughs> Did I get that right? Um, that's that's. Uh, thank you very much indeed for, for, for that one. Let, let's move straight on to Georgia Ellett Smith, uh, environmental engineer and UNESCO Special Envoy for Youth and the Environment. Uh, Georgia, over to you and tell us more about what Hi. you do and 
And okay. the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you. So I'm an environmental engineer. I've been uh, working in industry as a, an engineer and, and latterly as a sustainability consultant. I work primarily in the construction sector, um, construction and property sector. And of course, that sector is responsible for about 40% of the UK's carbon emissions. And um, it, it will be a similar figure globally. Um, now, my sort of participation in this event really comes from the fact that I am an environmental activist um, and I am currently a legal activist as well. So I am currently engaged in legal action against the UK government on the matter of waste and climate. Um, and the way that I came to this was that, um, you know, as I say, I've been working in the corporate sustainability sector um, in construction for, for over 20 years. Um, and yet we know that only about 20% of companies have uh, rigorous environmental policies. Um, as, as Shalaja pointed out, you know, incentives are perverse. What we're asking corporates to do is essentially cut their own throats um, in order to be more sustainable, in order to reduce carbon emissions. Um, there is a sort of posturing amongst corporates to appear green, whilst also really the incentive is to carry on business as usual and to continue polluting. And any organisation that wants to behave more sustainably, there is a cost associated to that. So the incentives are just completely in the wrong place, you know, and business as usual is incentivised to continue. So I work with corporates to try and find ways in which they can benefit and profit from doing a more sustainable thing and thankfully recently we've got you know since um since lockdown you know there seems to have been much more of a surge in environmental awareness amongst corporates and act activity in the run-up to cop i think a lot of that is to do with the uh the investment market and actually new rules in the city around um, requiring transparency over climate impacts on investment funds. And that is really driving now through industry, through economic instruments, actually in this capitalist investment market, it's really driving a refreshed concern into corporates about being able, at least being able to assess their carbon emissions and join this kind of rush to be able to claim that we are net zero. Now within that, there is an element of greenwash, which we're trying to, to tackle, but at least it's now happening, you know, a little bit late, and uh, but we're, we're getting there. My journey towards becoming a legal activist though, was because I am currently, and, and I have been for a long time campaigning against prolific waste incineration in the UK and in Europe. So a huge proportion of our waste goes to waste incineration. It's a result of the very, very effective landfill tax that was introduced. Instead of diverting waste into um, reduction, reuse, recycling, primarily it's diverted waste into incineration. And the UK government uh, now is, uh, it has various strategies in place. Incineration capacity in the UK is going to more than double over the next 10 years. If we think about, um, Going back to some of the points that were made earlier, you know, we must uh, reduce waste exports and we must reduce waste to landfill, particularly uh, decomposing waste to landfill. Um, but the response to that has been the worst possible of all the available options. The desirable option is waste reduction. But as has already been mentioned, that requires um, really uh, strong leadership against corporate lobbying, which I think is a really toxic force that is very present in our governments at the moment. Um, it requires strong leadership and strong extended producer responsibility and recycling targets, which is simply not there at the moment. And so the, the least best option is waste incineration and that is, that's doubling. Um, so my, uh, my, my progression into uh, legal uh, activism came because I had been campaigning against waste incineration. I was constantly getting battered back with greenwash, just constantly the same thing about, you know, we're, incineration is a green solution. It is a part of the circular economy. It is climate friendly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and a total lack of understanding of the science. And uh, at that point, I decided I needed to do more that being, in, being out on the streets with Extinction Rebellion as I was, you know, trying to make change 
um, I was in a position to be able to do more. And so with a legal team, I took the UK government, the Secretary of State for Bayes um, to the High Court. And we won a, a fantastic um, decision in there, which was that the judge ruled for the first time in a, an English court that the Paris Agreement demands short term urgent action, that the government cannot simply kick the can down the road to 2050 with this net zero target, which is sort of unicorns and fairies land. It's simply kicking the can down the road to the next administration. Um, and that was a, a fantastic step. Uh, but we're now going to court again because the government is hiding behind wordplay. In the uh, defence documents in my action in the High Court, they used a very cynical definition of the word limit. So the Climate Change Act in the UK requires the government to put in place uh, policies and schemes that limit greenhouse gas emissions. And the government's lawyers and the Secretary of State used the defence that they put in place a cap for carbon emissions, but the cap was almost 20% higher than any previously recorded UK carbon emissions. And they said that that was putting in place a limit and therefore they were consistent, uh, behaving consistently with the act. So I'm going back to court to seek a legal definition of the term limit because I maintain that if we are required to limit CO2 emissions, that must mean preventing an increase as an absolute minimum. And I feel in the run up to COP it, to frame this talk, if governments like the UK who are boasting about climate ambition and climate action, if governments like this are talking about the developed nations taking leadership in these issues, behind the scenes, they are using really cynical ploys to avoid real meaningful action. And that is the sort of thing that I want all of us, you know, to, to pay attention to and to start to challenge. And I really want, you know, normal people, you know, I, I started up not with any knowledge of the law whatsoever, but became so incensed by this hypocrisy that I started, you know, investigating avenues to really rise up and take meaningful action. And this avenue is open to, to any citizen. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss that later. So yeah, a little introduction to me and what I do, and I'll, I'll pass back to you. So thank you, Georgia. That's, and I'm sure we'll hear We'll hear more about that from you in the course of the discussion. Um, so our, our next speaker, our next panelist is Will Webster, Energy Policy Manager from Oil and Gas uh, UK. I'm, I'm aware, Will, that there's been a lot said about the fossil fuel industry so far. Um, you're the only representative on the panel for that industry, but um, the floor is yours. And uh, it's if, if we're seeing and hearing you okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. Take, take it forward. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. So um, I, I think I'll just describe um, what we see as the big challenges in reducing CO2 emissions and what we're doing as a sector to help contribute to the issue. Um, we're starting from a position where 70% of primary energy used in the UK is oil and gas. Um, and uh, that's uh, you know, something that will have to be addressed over the coming years and decades. Um, if you look at the Climate Change Committee, that's got to reduce to about 20 or 25 percent. So we're fully aware of the expectation that um, oil and gas as used in the UK economy will decline and eventually decline quite significantly. Um, the other challenge I think there is, is the investment challenge, which I think is the most important one. Um, so we've got to go from a situation where the energy sector invests around 20 billion a year um, in equipment, plant, et cetera, networks, power stations, et cetera, to something like 50 billion. Um, so that includes um, probably the bulk of that being in renewables. It's also things like carbon capture, and it's also things like biomass and changes to behavior and insulation and all those things. So the biggest challenge that we have actually is the investment challenge. Um, I think as far as our sector is concerned, we see that more as an opportunity than as a threat. Um, so we recently had a study done by our regulator, the Oil and Gas Authority. So around 60% of the CO2 reductions are gonna be from offshore facilities. So chiefly offshore wind, fixed and floating, things like carbon capture, and then also hydrogen production from renewables. Um, so all of those things are actually things that the oil and gas sector is really good at. So managing big projects offshore, looking after assets offshore, and raising the capital to do these kind of big projects. So 
I think what you're already seeing, and there's going to be a heck of a lot more of this, is um, companies realigning their investment portfolios around this kind of investment opportunity. So I think that's things will generally evolve. Um, we've just we've we've agreed with. Um, well, sorry, jump back a bit. Um, our regulator, the Oil and Gas Authority, recently rewrote all of its um, main um, strategic documents, which governs how it um, regulates the sector. So it's given itself, and it was approved by Parliament in February, it's given itself a role in reducing, um, encouraging the sector to reduce its own direct emissions. So things like methane emissions, which we're already very low at compared to globally, but also CO2 emissions from power generation offshore, which is the main direct emissions from oil and gas production. So there's a lot of pressure coming from the regulator on us to reduce emissions and there are various projects um, in hand to try and achieve that. Um, and then I think the other, the other part, bits that we've been talking to government about are the new frameworks for carbon capture and storage and hydrogen, which are part of the um, Prime Minister's 10 point plan um, and which will you know, play a fairly significant role, I think, in the um, pathway towards net zero. So those are all of the contributions and opportunities we are hoping to contribute to. I think as far as the kind of IEA report and the supply demand balance goes, I mean, I think we kind of agreed with 90% of the IEA report because you know, it, it pretty much highlighted the investment challenge significantly. I think as far as you know, supply and demand of oil and gas within the UK, we're doing a kind of real life experiment at the moment. So, um, you know, if, 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 you, if you have um, de- supply reductions going faster than demand, that, you know, generally results in higher prices and that's what we're seeing today. And I think the other issue is if you concentrate oil and gas resources in an ever smaller um, number of countries and, and uh, producers, that's gonna push up prices as well. So I think we're on, we used to talk about the trilemma of um, you know, environmental affordability and security of supply. I think we see it a bit more as a kind of it's quite a narrow pathway. So, um, you know, managing the managing this transition so that it is achieves what we uh, want it to do, but also delivers um, you know what's required for consumers, the economy, businesses, etc., and also the jobs that are all um, associated with that is a very narrow pathway. And you know we feel that you know making very precipitous changes and abrupt decisions about whether you continue with um, oil and gas production actually as it actually damages the transition because you'll lose public support for what people are trying to do. So what we've tried to set out is you know how you get down that fairly narrow path, and that does involve, in our opinion, more production and, a, and more exploration as well in the UK. So that's pretty much how we see it. Um, uh, we're fully bought into, you know, we're fully bought into both the 2050 target and also the interim targets. So 68% by 2030, I think it is. Um, we and and for us, it's the investment challenge that's needed to get there, which is the thing that we should be concentrating on. Thanks. Sorry, thank you very much indeed. As you might have noticed, the observant of you, I've had to move positions. I had a our Wi-Fi booster crashed. Uh, will I miss the beginning of your presentation? I've had to find a new spot on the landing and clear some laundry off the stairs um, uh, to try to catch up with, with where you all are. Um, did, did, did I just hear you right there, just to clarify something. So you, you, you accept as an industry, the, the 68% target by 2030. 100%. Yeah. Okay, well, we can, we can come back to that. We can come back to that. Thank you very much indeed. and. Um, uh, apologies for the weak Wi-Fi at my end. Um, our last panelist, uh, last but not least, Jeevan Vasagar, Environment Editor of the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. I think, um, if I'm right, the, the, it's getting into the environment is a fairly new angle for the Bureau, uh, which has uh, made itself famous for many other investigations in other kind of areas. But, uh, but Jeevan, over to you. Um, thanks very much, David. So I'm, I'm Jeevan Farsing. I'm Environment Editor of the Bureau of, Inve- of Investigative Journalism. Um, I'll speak briefly um, about um, who we are and give a sort of lightning tour of, of what we do on the environment. Um, so we're a not-for-profit 
based in London uh, with, with a global remit. Um, our focus is entirely on investigative journalism, so we're here to expose wrongdoing, uh, to discover new facts, um, to ask questions sort of in the public interest, basically. Um, we don't really have policy positions where we're not a party or a campaign group. We don't have campaign demands, uh, but we do have a sort of context for our journalism. And I'll, I'll say briefly really what that context is. Um, for our environment team, uh, I mean, there, there are a few different strands, but the, the core that I want to talk, to talk about tonight um, is industrial farming and its impact on climate change. Um, and really the focus for us um, over the past year on industrial farming has been looking at uh, deforestation in the Amazon and in the Cerrado, two sort of key habitats in Brazil. Uh, and the deforestation story is uh, a soy story. Um, now, you know, um, this may be an expert group, but when most uh, people think of soy, uh, they, if they think of it at all, they think of packets of bean curd in the fridge, they think of soy milk, um, but that's not how we eat soy. We eat soy by eating chicken. So about 77% of uh, the soy that's produced um, is produced to feed chicken. And chicken is the sort of the big meat that the world has been eating for the last few decades. So the, the whole kind of, we think of chicken as maybe this sort of traditional food, uh, but it's really a sort of post-war food. And the story of chicken is a story of uh, intense industrial farming powered by antibiotics and powered by feeds like soy. Um, and in order to produce the amount of soy um, that we need to produce the amount of meat that we want, um, we're, we're sort of ravaging natural environments um, and sort of deforesting uh, the Amazon at this sort of vast rate. So that's really been the focus of our journalism. And what we've done is trace some of the links between um, the suppliers um, out, uh, the farmers out in the Amazon who are uh, responsible for this damage, responsible for the, for, for the deforestation, um, looking at the um, big agricultural businesses, the big uh, uh, intermediary companies, giant companies that almost nobody has heard of, uh, businesses like Cargill and JBS um, who, are, who are buying from these suppliers um, and then tracing the chain all the way through to the supermarkets, to Sainsbury's, Tesco's, uh, Nando's, McDonald's, fast food outlets like this, um, where it's coming cons to consumers and, and mapping it all the way through the system. Um, the, the question with meat um, is a really, really sensitive one, I think. So if you compare it with energy, um, I think it's, it's sort of, you know, in some ways, in, in a very crude way, reasonably straightforward, what we want, what we want to do um, with fossil fuels. We want ultimately to keep them in the ground. We want to look for other sources of energy. Um, with food, you know, we clearly don't want to stop eating. Uh, we don't want to stop eating meat. Um, but what we need to do is find alternatives, think about where our meat comes from, and think about um, how the hunger for meat is driving deforestation. Um, and this is also a story about inequality for us. So um, Europeans eat about double the amount of protein um, they need to be eating to, to be healthy. Uh, in the US, it's very similar. Um, people in other parts of the world are eating much less protein than they should do. Um, they want to eat more. They legitimately want to eat more. So we're in a world where we're going to have to rethink, think about rebalancing resources, um, where those resources are directed, and, and how we do that in a sustainable way. Um, the question of how we fix this um, is sort of beyond us as journalists. That's for other people to answer. Um, but I think it's going to be a really, really sticky problem. And you saw some indication of that very recently um, when there was talk about meat tax, a meat tax in the UK. Um, and the government very, very quickly put out a story, I think, in The Sun um, saying that just wasn't, wasn't going to happen. We're not going to come for your burgers. Um, so this is, this is going to be a sort of... Uh, a big political fight, uh, but one that we really, really need to have and really need to think about. Um, and I'll end there. Well, look, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeevan, and, and to all of you so, for so clearly laying out uh, some really key key elements of context there about your own work and and kind of where we're, where we are now, what needs to, to, to be done. Let, let, let's drill into the, the, the latter bit of that, I think, straight away. I mean, if the theme of the evening is is, is radical action, uh, Paul, you, uh, Paul Eakins, you, you've you've touched on uh, uh, some of what's needed, but I mean, perhaps you could take us through first specifics um, in, in 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 really pragmatic terms of let's say the top three things that you think would would get us on a, on the right pathway, uh, and you know, with COP twenty six in mind, obviously. Well. Um, thanks, David. Um, I'm an economist, so I'm sure it won't surprise anyone that uh, one of my top three would definitely be a carbon tax. Uh, and the proposals for carbon taxation 
that have been made for many, many years. Uh, I actually was uh, one of the European Commission's advisors when it was trying to introduce a carbon energy tax in the early 1990s, before it even thought of its emission trading system. But it suffers from exactly what Jeevan has been talking about with the meat tax, that everyone thinks it's a good idea until governments actually propose it. And then even those who say they care about climate change suddenly acquire a concern for poor people, which they've never formally showed, um, and say, well, it will uh, have a bad effect on poor people, as if there are no ways of compensating poor people through such things as warm home discounts um, for, uh, for that. I mean, as we know, uh, rich people actually consume much more carbon than poor people, so it would be a very progressive, um, progressive tax, provided you use the revenues uh, to compensate the, the, the lower income people. And I've done uh, academic studies till they come out of my ears on all that stuff. Um, but um, government so far has been deaf to it. Um, UK is not bad, actually, compared to some countries. We do have a carbon tax supplementing the EU ETS on fossil fuel power generation, and that had a huge impact on driving coal out of, the, um, out of our power generation mix. But there's all sorts of stuff which, uh, does, which escapes. Um, the carbon tax. So that's number one. Number two on the demand side is uh, very much um, the most difficult is actually getting people to insulate their homes and change their heating systems. I, I bet um, a penny to a pound that we all have uh, gas boilers in our homes or flats and they've all got to go. Um, by 2040 they've all got to go and that's one generation of gas boilers because they last about 15 years. And at the moment, we haven't a clue how to do that. We haven't a clue how to insulate the homes so that we can heat them more efficiently. And we haven't a clue about heat pumps. And most importantly, the guys who drive around in white vans don't know how to install heat pumps. And therefore, we've got a huge learning curve and a huge investment. And that picks up uh, Will's point about the need for investment. Um, my, my third point is, is very much, um, a bit of a challenge to Will, I guess, because um, I, I hear, you know, I've been involved in the last week in the public inquiry against the, at least I was speaking against the coal mine uh, in Cumbria. It seems to me completely bonkers to think that the UK is going to open a coal mine in 2021. Um, and I feel very similarly about the oil uh, and, and gas uh, extractions that are being proposed for the North Sea. And that argument about security of supply, well, it's an argument that every country in the world is using um, to justify their own extraction as opposed to the extraction of somebody else. And that's why we're on a track to produce 120% more fossil fuel than we possibly should if we're keen on, um, if we're keen on 1.5 degrees. And so my third point would very much be to take the IEA seriously and say no new coal mines, no new oil and gas fields. And that will of course mean that the maximum economic recovery policy of the government on the North Sea is gonna to have to change. But then in a 1.5 degree world, if everybody produced their maximum economic recovery from all the oil and gas that they have in the ground, well, we'll fry many times over. So it's a policy that makes sense for the UK, especially economically, but it doesn't make any sense at all for the world as a whole and it will be a major elephant trap for COP26 uh, if, um, if, if, if it comes up then, because the government will be exposed as being blatantly hypocritical, telling everybody else to keep oil and gas in the ground, but doing everything it can to dig its own out. So there we go. Paul, th thank you very much. And, and, and Will, I will come to you in just a sec, but I want to just at this stage pick up a few more of these very specific kind of recommendations or suggestions um, in the context of the radical action required in and around COP26. Uh, uh, Shailaja, would you, would you take forward your remarks about, about waste? I mean, sp specifically, what would you like to see by way of radical action on that front to avoid this second New Delhi sized landfill site which i can't stop thinking about Thank you, um, David. <laughs> uh, kind of you know perhaps and, and i mean obviously your your thinking is global but i, I wouldn't mind also hearing you know, a suggestion a recommendation that might be uk specific right um so um 
I, when I said the UK is the second biggest producer of waste, I meant specifically plastic waste. Right. So we yes. are particularly bad at plastic. And there's something uh, quite important to think about plastic because recycling of plastic is not easy. So the dry recyclables, that category is plastic, paper, cardboard, metal and glass. And that's close to 40 percent of all municipal waste. And less than 14 percent of that entire group can actually be recycled. So when we're told in the UK, go and put everything in the recycling center, we actually say put, we're putting four fifths of what we are dumping is going to go into global trade or our landfills. So the UK in particular has to think really hard. It's bizarre that we are generating so much plastic waste that we're second to the US. But more importantly, our current system of managing and just disaggregating municipal waste is not fit for purpose. And that is something we have to think about very, very hard. And that links to the point that Jeevan was making. It's exactly the same idea that we don't have either a food system in terms of consumption, it's good for us, or a waste management system. And the two of them go together. Food waste is the other part of this. And so we've got a system which is a throwaway and we are getting worse off. And that's why I gave the example of the landfill case in the UK. It will leach not just into the air and cause, as it did in the case of this young boy, uh, a loss in his quality of life to the point that you know his mother thought he wasn't going to live, but also it will leach into the land system that we have. And it seems to me another case of bizarre practice to talk of rewilding, rewatering, all of which I am completely for. But if you're going to have a massive landfill alongside it, it is a complete nonsense. So we've got to do circular thinking and we will talk about it, but it has to be done in terms of thinking about what it is that is polluting the land system. And as so just said that if we can't incinerate it and we shouldn't be incinerating it, we've got to do a fundamental rethink on what gets sorted and how do we manage it. Some very exciting new technologies in terms of thinking about this and maybe Will can talk more about what industry could do with the right kind of incentives. But that's my biggest concern. The UK punches above its weight in terms of waste manufacture, but we are not very honest. So even the plastic that we send outside to other countries, be it to, now we have the prior consent principle now in place. So countries have to say whether they want to, and China said no, India or Turkey, but the quality of what goes out, you can open those containers, supposed to have paper or plastic, they have human refuse in them. So we are not being an honest broker and we are not doing clean trade. So I really would think both in terms of managing types of waste in the UK, but having a much more thought provoking discussion of how we manage national trade in international trade. And, and, I mean, just to be clear, and that, that, that is fascinating that obviously, I mean, I'm not aware of waste of these issues being particularly on the agenda at COP26, but no. you're arguing as Georgia is, that actually they kind of need to be part of the thinking that's going on there. Georgia, do you want to just pick this up? I mean, so, okay, you're saying, obviously we're here, we don't want to landfill. Mm -hmm. We don't want to incinerate. We don't want to export. What, just, 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 just give me the, the, the radical plan <laughs> that you're calling for. Avoid. If none of those three are any good. <laughs> Avoid. And the problem is we're so... We're so busy thinking about the outputs of the system, of how to deal with all the rubbish that's coming out of consumerism. And ultimately, you know, back to back to what Paul was saying earlier about economics in our system, it's follow the money, you know, and and the point is waste is big business, you know, but there's big companies internationally making billions of pounds out of treating our waste. It's in nobody's interest to reduce waste. You know, big companies, the, I won't name the company, but the world's biggest soft drink manufacturer produces 200,000 plastic bottles a minute. That's 33 football fields of plastic bottles a day. That's going into the system and they're not paying a single penny towards the cost of dealing with that waste at the end of its life. And all we're really looking at then is all of this material that's entering the system and how we're going to deal with it. The answer is to stop producing it in the first place. But that takes strong 
government. And it takes a particularly strong government to stand up to the corporate lobbyists and the pressures to keep things the way they are because the system is profitable for very many people, including the waste processes at the end of the day. So we really need a rethink, a joined up thinking that actually brings into um, its core right. the idea of avoiding the waste in the first place. And, and that obviously involves retailers, right? It involves education of consumers. I'm just thinking of well, I think I think follow the money. Store around the corner here. Uh, follow the money. Um, you know, if we're taxing right. virgin resources appropriately, if we're controlling material coming into the system in the first place appropriately, the market will find a way. You know, and we can allow businesses to do what they do best, which is actually innovate within the prevailing system. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, look, let, let, let's get let's get to, to Will now again with with you know, some of the points that Paul has raised that, that specifically I know that there are elements within the oil and gas industry. And I think you nodded when the carbon tax was was mentioned. I mean, I don't know whether that's I mean, you know, critics of your industry have said there is support in the industry for a carbon tax because they know it'll never happen. I mean, just to be cynical for a yeah. moment. I mean, and, and that, that's probably picking up from something Paul Paul said. But I mean, I mean, just to go back to your your, your sort of remarks. I mean, how does the industry envisage being part of a sixty eight percent cut in UK emissions by twenty thirty? If you're also making the case that an increase in production is is essential for for a fair transition. Hmm. Yeah, it's not a, um, so thanks David. Yeah, so just to clarify on that, it's not really an increase in production because um, existing resources will just drop, they drop off basically at about 8% a year if you, if you don't invest. So the decline in production, if you don't sort of replace what is being de decommissioned by new assets is actually very steep. Um, and the new the new investments are actually usually less emission intensive than the ones going off the system. So you do get a gain, albeit a small one, by bringing in new investment. But in terms of um, carbon prices, carbon taxes, well, as far as the UK and European Union is concerned, it's happened. So uh, the price is 60 euros a tonne now. Um, we pay that on any every tonne that is emitted. Um, and so do other large industries and large industrial users and the aviation sector. So it's a reality. Um, in terms of... Um, I, I mean, I think the the other the other thing, just just to pick up on one thing Paul said, is that the the maximising economic recovery thing has already changed to some degree because, as I said earlier, the OGA has got a new um, primary objective that it also includes assisting the Secretary of State in achieving the net zero target. Um, and the other the other kind of interesting thing that's happened in the last two or three weeks is that um, Bayes put out its figures on. Um, societal cost of carbon to use in all government appraisal, and that includes regulators like the OGA. So that's um, the figure that is now going to be used in government appraisal for 2020. It's not 60 euros a ton, it's 200 pounds a ton. And it's going to go up, and there's a projection going up to four, it's about 400 pounds a ton by 2050. So that's pretty, that's got the potential to be pretty far re reaching because it's going to be included in how the, how a kind of treasury green book appraisal of economic policy is done. So, um, you know, all of that is, you know, it's, uh, you know, all pointing in the same in terms of direction of travel. Um, so I think the, um, you know, I, I'm not a big expert in the waste sector, et cetera, but, you know, it, it's, to me, it seems odd that we are exporting waste around the world. So, you know, if you want a your local circular economy, you've got to deal with it somehow at home. You know, I'm not an expert in the various issues with landfill incineration, etc. So I won't really comment on that. But I think the principle for us, the principle also applies into what industrial goods you are importing. So the, there's a lot of discussion in the European Union at the moment about the carbon border adjustment. And I think that is something that is likely to you know, increase in importance as we go ahead with this journey. So, um, you know, and, and you can extend that a bit further and say, well, if, if, if the countries we're importing goods for on don't have a carbon price, or if they don't know what their emissions are, or if they haven't measured their methane emissions, you know, you're going to start, to, I, I think we'll start to get to a point where the countries that are signed up to the, 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 um, the, the, the climate change objectives will say, well, we're just not going to import that stuff anymore. And that could be diesel, it could be 
you know it could be um petrochemicals it could be you know cement it could be anything and you know that's why we think you know the principles of the circular economy also extend to what the oil and gas sector is in any particular location and you know we think the responsible thing to do is not to um sort of abrogate responsibility by saying well we can just import all of this from qatar and you know we'll not worry about it um you've got to look after your own house in doing all of this and we're we're, we're very conscious you know the size of the house is going to get smaller so there's going to be a reduction in demand of oil and gas and that will come from making progress against the targets as as as, as set out so you know and we but as i said earlier there's a you know you've got to walk quite a narrow pathway to keep this something that um you know gives you the the um the transition that you know people can live with basically just to be clear and sorry i don't want to think i'm pressing you but but to, to deliver the 68 percent you're envisaging a decline in production i mean you mentioned that if there's no yeah. new uh, resources coming online at an eight percent drop in output every year yeah, so but does yeah, that does that fine. get you if you're bringing in cambo a new oil field does that get you to your 60 percent well the 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 actual the emissions from oil and gas production are actually only about three or four percent of the total sure because it's really all scope three right yeah the cut in emissions that we're talking about for the uk as a whole come from our consumption of you know oil gas electricity um and that's the thing that you know is important to reduce you know so and we are expecting that the government will put in place policies to reduce demand. And, you know, accordingly, we would expect our contribution to that to be a bit smaller by the time we get to 2035. Oh, I see. So that, that kind of gets new you, investment, I'm afraid. Right. That gets you to, for example, getting rid of the gas boilers that Paul has talked about, that, that demand within the UK for fossil fuels will fall. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. That, that's think, part of your, yeah, OK. Yeah. Fine, fine, fine. No, Indeed. That's part of our sort of planning yeah. assumptions, let's okay. say. Um, so, I mean, th thanks for clarifying that. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I forget who it was. I think, Georgia, you touched on um, uh, greenwash. I mean, you know, I'm aware that this comes up kind of all the time as a topic. And, and, and I guess, Jeevan, this is something that you're, you're kind of looking at. I mean, what, what for you, as in the context of the need, as discussed, for radical action, um, to the extent to which, as investigative journalists you're 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 taking nothing at face value can i i'll just um take a point oh, on okay that. um sure the the subject of my first legal action against the government was actually the the uk emissions trading scheme and if i just want to make a point about emissions trading schemes they are an abject failure um major emitters use who are uh, operating under the emissions trading scheme actually make a profit from the scheme it acts as a disincentive. And actually, the cement sector, for example, made around about 4 billion euros of profit from the EU emissions trading scheme over the course of the last 10 years. The, on average, the major emitting sectors make about um, between one and a half and two billion pounds of profit for each of the major emitting sectors. So these systems do not work. They're, they're essentially bureaucratic systems. But sorry, you're, uh, you're arguing they that they're making those profits while not reducing emissions? Yes. I mean, are they not achieving what they're designed to do? As your well, what's actually happening is or they do, are on the way they do actually reduce emissions. They're, they're partially reducing emissions through technological advancements, but actually the system itself works incredibly well for them because they get a certain amount of free allowance, which they trade. There's a whole hedging, um, trading of carbon credits market. And that is where they... Uh, obtain their profits so actually simply by participating in the scheme it becomes a new profit um, center for the business and so you know these these perverse schemes are not very well thought through and actually are supported by industry because they end up finding a way of making a profit from but, them so you know they're, they're just, sorry, not I mean, just jumping to, on that just, may, but, yeah. but sorry just put paul just, just if i may just clarify that but i mean george are you saying that that i mean that the fact that they make profits from a scheme what one could, one could argue is is distinct from whether they the scheme reduces emissions. Yeah, that I mean that's I suppose yes that is true. The e, and, and, the and if you're seeking a reduction of emissions, yeah, it has partially reduced emissions. It has not reduced them substantially, and it okay. certainly hasn't reduced them in line with the requirements of the climate emergency. Got it. it is not an effective instrument to decarbonize quickly. 
And the, like I say, the, the, the point of my legal action with the UK emissions trading scheme was actually the carbon cap, the ceiling of allowances that was available is almost 20% higher than industrial CO2 emissions at the moment. So that sends a very strong signal to those industries within scope that actually there's no need to invest in decarbonisation because the ceiling is so high that there is no real downward force on, okay. you know, and we all need to have strong signals right. from... Pa Paul, I will come back to you, but I just want to bring in Jeevan here because, I mean, clearly, in again, in the context of radical action, presumably one of your big themes as a, a, a team of investigative journalists is to, is to probe what's sincere about corporate action, what's insincere and can come under that uh, description yeah, of Yeah, absolutely. So maybe one of the critical questions for us um, is the one of uh, eliminating deforestation. And the companies uh, that we speak to, particularly the sort of big agribusinesses um, operating in Brazil, talk about eliminating uh, illegal deforestation by a certain date. Um, and, and there are two things that sort of often kind of, you know, in our in our reporting have sort of been re recurrent features really of that, two or three things. One of them is that the date often keeps creeping. So it'll sort of creep backwards, you know, further and further. You arrive at 2021 and it's sort of gone back to 2025. But, but, sorry, just um, on, on that, I mean, the, the, there was a moratorium, wasn't there, that, that I think Greenpeace helped to broker back in 2006. I reported on it involving the four biggest buyers of soya in the Amazon. Yeah that I think was, at least for a good many years, regarded as, if not a total success, at least so, making so a difference. We do think this moratorium um, is a good thing, but actually one of our stories this year focused on the moratorium and how how well or poorly it's worked. Um, we found there's been a, there was a significant loophole in it, um, which is you can't deforest, um, you're not, not allowed now to deforest the Amazon for soy, Yes. Uh, but you can cut down the Amazon for other purposes. Right. So what's been happening is that soy farmers have been cutting down the trees grazing cattle there, um, producing soy on supposedly clean parts of their farm and then, and then trading into the moratorium. And of course, what happens after a few years is that deforested land is then, is then sort of legalised, they have title to it, um, and then that then becomes part of the so-called sort of clean soy supply chain. Um, so, I mean, one of the big questions for us, well, there are two sort of big questions for us really as far as soy is concerned. Um, one of them is this question of illegal deforestation. So the government in its environment bill at the moment has talked about eliminating illegal deforestation, but really it's all kinds of deforestation that are the problem and legality can often be a sort of fig leaf um and the other is the question of the sort of mixing of clean and dirty soy because this is such a fungible commodity um and it can be very very hard to know you know whether the soy that arrives in the uk that is supposedly sustainable and um, where exactly this is from um so you know you talked about radical action earlier david so there is a, a question um, and it's not one that we necessarily have an answer to, but there is a question, I think, for UK retailers to answer about whether they can, in good faith, carry on doing business with um, with many of the sort of Brazilian soy suppliers because because they have such a problematic I mean, track just record. A, a, as a quick counterpoint, I mean, technology, in a sense, is on your side, isn't it, in terms of traceability? I'm thinking of the combination of satellites, um, blockchain. I mean, isn't there, there's, isn't there there's a whole suite of measures that make it arguably slightly easier to... to to, to distinguish clean from the dirty. There are plenty of, um, yeah. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of talk about being able to trace, uh, about um, putting cattle on the blockchain, um, recording pigs' faces with videos and knowing exactly where your, your sausage is just come from it's from this particular pig uh, but when we when it when, when we go and investigate when we go and um uh, track what is actually happening on the ground in the amazon um it's a, a much more um it's a much more murky picture um we found evidence of cattle from farms that are um in, on a deforested amazon land being traded in to be, become part of the legal right, right, supply yeah, chain yeah, yeah, um, yeah. you know so it's it's a it's a really messy yeah, picture on yeah. the ground and and the, and the tech i'm yeah. afraid is is part of the, the yeah, spin yeah yeah i've had the fortune or the misfortune to go back over 20 years to the same bit of the amazon and uh, just watch it be transformed actually despite all of the measures and all of the talk and all the whatever yeah. From, from forest to, to farmland. Paul, you wanted to jump in, I think on an earlier point, but um, if, if, you, if you haven't forgotten what it was <laughs> and if it's still relevant, uh, over to you. Sure, yes, no, I, I don't, I try not to forget what things are, but um, <laughs> no, I, I, I really do want to come in on the emission trading system because yeah. that's something that I've studied pretty intensively over the last 20 years. 
Um, and, and firstly, I mean, your sense, David, seems to me to be absolutely right. It has not only reduced emissions according to the trajectory that it was set out to do, but it's actually reduced emissions faster than that because the European Commission has invented the market stability reserve, which takes allowances off the market and cancels them in order to try to push the price up. And that's been an enormously important innovation. Um, and that's what's driven the price up from about five euros a ton, which is what it was in the middle of the 2010s, um, up to about 50 or 60 euros a ton now, as Will said, uh, Will said earlier. And um, it's obviously true that from the current perspective, uh, the rate of reduction of emissions was nothing like fast enough to get to where we need to get to. Uh, but that also has been fixed uh, now, and the, um, the, the rate of reduction of emissions per, per year has been increased from 1.8% to 2.4%, and over 10 years that actually amounts to quite a big reduction, uh, in line with the European Commission's target now of a 55% reduction by 2030. I absolutely agree with Georgia's point about the, the windfall profits, and the windfall profits were absolutely essential if we wanted to have a manufacturing industry in Europe, for precisely the reason that Will mentioned, that if these guys had had to buy their emission permits at anything like the current rate, I mean, obviously five euros a ton uh, might not have made so much difference, but certainly anything above 10 euros a ton would simply have driven them out of business. And that's the importance of the carbon border adjustment mechanism that Will mentioned, that, um, in the future, and this is part of the European Commission's uh, Green Deal proposals, in the future, imports into uh, uh, the European Union, at least, and obviously that won't um, apply to the UK unless we decide to join this particular scheme. Um, I'm putting money on that, but the current government, but that's a different question. Um, imports into the European Union will have to uh, either show that they have an equivalent carbon price in place in their country of origin, or they will have to pay a carbon tax as part of their import tariff into the EU. And um, I, I mean, I just feel so pleased. I mean, this is something which makes absolute economic sense. And uh, it's been on the cards for some years, but has always been stymied by the kind of free traders who say you're interfering in markets. But of course, carbon isn't in markets. We have to create markets. Um, so I, I think we are beginning to get that. Uh, and I think under the current circumstances, uh, the emissions trading system uh, is certainly better than nothing. And it's impossible for the EU to introduce carbon taxes because of the way the EU is structured. Um, and I think can actually be a very effective mechanism with the market stability reserve and the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, the one has been put in place and the other is about- uh, Georgia, I can sort of sense over the <coughs> airwaves that you want to come in on that. Um, I do. But I mean, I mean yeah. just to pick up on, on one of Paul's points, yeah. uh, I mean, if it has produced this emissions reduction that Paul has outlined, that, that's, that's surely a good thing it's um, Whatever so, uh, the my focus is, is on the UK and what's happened okay. now with Brexit, where the UK has taken in, uh, has now created its own emissions trading scheme. It has used the yeah. opportunity to to jump, jump forward with greenwash and say we're reducing our total carbon reserve by five percent more than it would have been under the EU. Yeah, but that's still 17 percent higher than current business as usual emissions. They haven't gone far enough. So there's a massive greenwash here with the UK emissions trading scheme. And they started the auctions at 15 pounds a tonne. So, and they did that, that deliberately. I've seen ministerial correspondence as part of my legal action. They deliberately priced it at a point where it would benefit UK industry, it would smooth the transition. They had no, there was no environmental impetus there at all to reduce carbon emissions. It was all about maintaining business competitiveness, all of it. I absolutely um, agree with that, by the way. I mean, oh, I've got, okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. okay. I've yeah. got absolutely okay. no quarrel with those arguments. Okay. The UK emissions trading system is a disgrace. Right. Uh, uh, Will, do you want to come in on this? I mean, how things work for your industry how we move forward and then in, in particular the, the, this this I, i'm sorry to keep coming back to it but how one achieves 
the, the radical reductions in emissions that are outlined in the various government plans and, and, and how your industry contributes to that yeah. and whether well, trading is the route or not. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a bit confused about the previous discussion because the, 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 the auction cleared at, I think, about £48 a tonne, the first one, and the UK certificates are now trading at a £5 a tonne premium off, off the EU, EU price. So I don't really quite know how it's not particularly working. I mean, it's 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 a... Uh, you know, it makes you wonder. Well, you know, you can you can turn into a Brexit discussion, but you know, it's it's kind of working in pretty much the same way as the EU scheme, with a lot of the same criteria and coverage, etc. So, I I don't really see much difference between the two schemes, to be honest. Um, the uh, yeah, well, you know, carbon prices will drive behaviour. You know, if 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 it hits um, companies, if it hits um, the way um, we use energy in society, then you know, that's got that's you know going to be a good thing i think you know so it will drive all sorts of new technologies and new innovation i think you know you're seeing the the contracts for differences on the renewables on the um on the renewables program you know not needing we're not really needing much subsidy anymore whereas they used to get a lot obviously um so you know i i think it's it's a positive thing all around to have a have a carbon price that you know at least starts to reflect the 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 cost of of um of uh, what it's what it's the effect it's having so you know i think you know yeah you know it might not be ideal but i think it's it's really a start and i think it's the tool that it's you know wh whether people like the scheme or not i mean the eu sees it as the central tool to reduce emissions and get to the 55 percent reduction um yeah i i'm not there's there's i know there's a discussion in the second half of this year around how quickly the UK trajectory will come down. I think there's going to be a consultation on that in the second half of this year. So we'll see how that comes out or wh and whether it delivers this 5% um, better than the EU scheme, which was definitely the boast at the time that the UK scheme was launched. So we'll, we'll, I think we'll see how that one comes out. But just to get the numbers straight in my head, what, at what price do the things, what price would drive radical change? In the industry <laughs> yeah um well you know we I, I think it's quite it is quite interesting you know i've followed this for a long time as well so um you know you used to see these kind of the 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 consultants used to produce these marginal abatement cost curves and say well if you want to reduce this much you have to go to 40 euros if you want to take this much out you have to go to 80 and you know if you want to take a load more out you have to go to 100 or 200 but actually things have changed massively because um, nobody really anticipated the success of offshore wind in terms of cost reduction and the scale of the, the, the size of the investments that are now made. So when I was at RWE, another energy company, sorry, um, you know, the, the, the assumption was that the, the wind turbines offshore would be two or three megawatts. So now they make the wind turbines 15 megawatts. So they're, you know, seven times bigger. They're probably three times taller than, you know, what people were assuming just 10 years ago. And that's led to a massive reduction. In the in the cost of offshore wind, and you know, that's why the government sees it as a as a big priority. And nobody envisaged things like floating wind, which is is, is going to be the next big thing. Um, and so, you know, it's it's you know, people do a lot of forecasting today on the basis of today's prices and today's technologies. And you know, by the time we get to twenty, you know, it's a bit like trying to do something about the internet in nineteen ninety. Um, with the state of the internet was then and you know you could just about send an email in those days so um you know i think think you know there, there are a lot there are probably a lot of un, un, uh, in, you know technologies that are yet to be implemented that you know will will change that kind of relationship a bit during the next 30 but, years sorry you're so. arguing that the rise the unexpectedly fast rise of wind and with its costs falling at the same time has, has had a bearing on decisions in the oil and gas industry. Yeah, I think it has. I, I mean, I think, you know, people, as I said at the start, I think, you know, people in the oil and gas industry now see offshore energy, you know, as the as the opportunity. I, you know, I think it varies between the different um, different businesses. But, you know, you can see how they are, you know, looking to make a move into this, you know, this growth area, basically. And that's what businesses do. They look to see what the growth areas are. That come from policy and technology and what consumers and society wants and you know they try and go there because that's where the you know that's where they can have a successful business
But, but I think my main point is it's quite hard to say, you know, what sort of price you need because you don't know what, you know, how things are going to change in terms of technology. Um, F, um, right, right. Yeah, there are so many sort of unexpected uh, uh, mm -hmm. angles in this. Um, um, th th let's kind of move on, if you'd like, to a, to a I mean, obviously related the topic and and and, and again I, i'm always trying to keep cop 26 in mind partly because i'm making notes from this it's truly really brilliant and i gotta go to cop 26 but i mean shailish i mean we we you you've made this extremely strong case on 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 waste but uh, as we've touched on it isn't i don't think a formal part of the, the cop 26 agenda in, in in what way then would you like to see it either sort of creep into the discussions or be forced in or in some way get addressed in a way that's meaningful in in your terms i mean you you, you know you've made the point that the methane belching off land actually i filmed that uh, and it and it's quite a, a a sort of a striking process to think of how much gas is is coming off in that way but but how do you see that kind of angle getting folded into what's going to happen in Glasgow? It's a really good point, David. I'll give you two ways it can come in. One is we now know that with the forest fires that we've had blazing, that when a forest fire has hit an underground or landfill area, it blazes much more rapidly because there's this powder keg, if you like, of methane, which is about to explode. So there's if you're thinking as the temperature rises, there can be combustion without any interference by human, you know, I, I, and, I and that heard could of that. cause is, 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 a fire. Okay, is that in Australia? Where's that happened? That's it, in Australia, so okay, that's where okay. they're very concerned. That's the first side. So if we're thinking thinking it's going to be 2.7, then, you know, the, the, the idea that we could have combustion and then could create forest fires, even if we manage forest fires, means we have to at least have GIS mappings of all the places that we have landfills. That would be the first thing to do if you wanted to mitigate it. That's the first. The second is landfills vary hugely, and we have very poor estimates of the actual emissions of a range of gases. In a addition to all the pollution that in the waterway. So in some countries like in Germany, other European countries, they have tried to separate out in the landfill. So you've got the degradation of different materials happening at different rates being managed. If you dump them all together, then you have a land that will degrade and become compost or other systems. So under landfill policy that different countries have, and they all say they have landfill policies and they are recycling, there's a huge range. And so if countries decided to talk about, you know, uh, landfill and its potential danger, we're not even talking with the same set of parameters. And that to me is the iceberg okay. below the water and the one above is the spontaneous combustion aspect. And so that the two sides that, you know, you would, I would have thought that if COP26 is about laying out what we're going to do going forward, we need to think about. But the other point is we don't really have, even the estimate of the World Bank of 2050, we're going to, you know, double the amount of uh, the waste and it's gonna be faster than the rate of population growth. It's not based on any knowledge about uh, you know, how this would work with, for example, Will's point about industry or Paul's point about tax. I don't think a plastic tax at the end where the consumer is going to pay 5p for a plastic bag is even scratching the surface. If you're going to think about it, you've got to think about what are the implications of that, you know, whatever big vat going in uh, into the land, just like we had David Attenborough talking about plastics going into the ocean. We need to think about it in the same sense because that landfill plastic will also find its way into the ocean. And we have got no idea. So that one level, we need to do complex studies of how landfills are managed. But another, which is much easier, the first part, identify every landfill that we've got. And going forward, all the new landfills that we're going to build. Okay, that's, that's, that's really clear. And I just want to pick up a question that's come up uh, from our audience, James Hewitt. Well, he says it's not really a question, more of a statement, but he, he brings up the topic of carbon capture and storage. 
um, and that it's failed and the storage can't be guaranteed. And I, I mean, I know from previous COPs, whether it's formally on the agenda or not, it always seems to be talked about. And I, I'm wondering whether we might just um, kick that around uh, just very briefly. I mean, well, and I, I know it's it's something that in the in the broadly the fossil fuel industries have been looking at for many many years. The criticism is that they've never thrown serious money at the problem, and they've waited for governments to stump up for cash, and that's never really happened properly. And none of these systems have really either paid their way or proved their worth on an industrial scale. But I mean, how alive in your discussions in your world is? Is carbon capture, bearing in mind, you know, the the, the, the well patchy track record to date. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thanks, David. Well, every single independent agency, whether it's the IEA, whether it's the Climate Change Committee, or anyone else, thinks that CCS is totally and absolutely essential, um, and we agree. Um, in terms of um, you know where the track record so far, I think. What we're talking about is actually a massive step change from the projects that have been done to date to the future ones. Um, what we are moving Sorry, just to jump in, do those future mm -hmm. ones happen on a time scale that helps deliver to 2030? Because yeah, it seems yeah, to I me mean, there's, there's a disconnect there. there. No, well, the the what's planned is that there were there's there's uh, the plan is for um, up to four cluster projects which we're going to be capturing industrial emissions in the UK okay. um, taking uh, by 2030 and taking around 10 million tonnes uh, of CO2 per year and injecting it into either depleted oil and gas fields or um, saline aquifers. And I think the difference between the future vision for CCS and the past is that the, the industry will be you know, one that is an industry in its own right. And, and, and almost like a, you know, a, a, um, you know, a, a carbon management service. So you know, taking the emissions from in industrial production and uh, putting, them, putting them out of the atmosphere, uh, you know, up to you know, two kilometers below the surface. Um, the, the, the one important thing to note is that carbon capture itself will be covered by the emission trading scheme. So if there is any release of CO2, then the, the people who are operating those sites will themselves then have to pay the carbon tax or the carbon price. So there's going to be a lot more emphasis on making sure the projects are successful. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I dispute the fact that, you know, you know, I think some projects have probably gone better than others, and I don't know all of them, but, you know, there are certainly good examples of, you know, some of the earlier CCS projects that are a good model to go forward with. So, you know, the... But, but I, I, I think the point is until now, it's kind of been, I, I think you're probably fair to say it's been treated as a bit of a Cinderella or an afterthought. But in the future, it will be considered a key part of national infrastructure that um, there's a route to dispose of CO2 emissions and for that to make its required contribution to the, um, the objective of uh, you know, dealing with emissions. OK, and I just wondering whether Paul has a perspective on that as an economist, whether you ever see it making economic sense? Uh, well, it's an end of pipe solution and end of pipe solutions are always more expensive than non end of pipe solutions, sort of integrated solutions, if you like. Uh, I think Will's absolutely right that that if we can't make it work, and in particular, if we can't make it work with bioenergy, which is appears in all these models enormously uh, to give us negative emissions, uh, then we can kiss goodbye to two degrees, not just 1.5, um, because um, all the models that I work with suggest that by the middle of the century, you're actually capturing from the atmosphere through woody biomass 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide. That's billion tons a year. And uh, the scale of that is simply mind boggling compared with where we are at the moment, where a reasonably large carbon capture and storage facility, such as you've got in, uh, in the North Sea and the Sleipner field, for example, captures 1 million tons per year. So you've got to go from mm. 1 million to 10 billion mm. over uh, the period of 20 or 30 years. And, and again, the investment that would be required for that, not just in the carbon capture infrastructure, and obviously there's pipes and compressors and all sorts of stuff to go in there, um, 
but also in actually growing the trees uh, and trying to ensure that you don't do damage to agriculture or biodiversity at the same time uh, is a simply monumental challenge. And that's why quite a few analysts have actually call all the, these numbers la la land because there's right. no conceivable way that we're actually going <laughs> to deliver them. And, and I think your point, David, is very good about the 2030 timescale because this is big infrastructure. And while we could certainly deliver a few slight size fields um, by 2030, a million tons a year kind of stuff, um, it, it's not at a global level, it's not going to make a significant contribution to getting the 40 to 50% reductions in fossil fuel emissions that we need to, uh, to, to, to stick on track for anything like a 1.5 degree. So it, it's a huge sure. challenge. And, uh, but, but as Will said, frankly, we've got ourselves in a situation where if we don't make it work, then the temperature rise mm. is going to be much more than the models suggest, hey. because all the models have got this in their big time. Yeah, basically, we should have started this 20 years ago. Indeed, we well, should. I and, mean, I, uh, I did a report about it 18 years ago, and, and it's been it's been extremely, extremely slow progress, it seems to me, ever, ever since. Um, look, we're, we're kind of entering the final stretch here. I mean, I think there's been some, some terrific insights have, have come out. Just to touch on a few of the questions, um, uh, Ray Lancashire asking actually, which I keep puzzling over, how is there a shortage of CO2 in the country uh, when we're creating so, so much uh, that uh, um, Nicholas Travassus, Valdea, uh, carbon capture and storage is prohibitively expensive um, and marginal success. Well, we've sort of touched, we've touched on that. A couple of questions have been brought up about, you know, the inevitable uh, the perpetual chasing of growth, whether the capitalist model itself is uh, still fit for purpose but let, let, let's i think we've probably reached the point where i'd like to ask each of you for a, a, a sort of a minute or two to start to kind of sum up you know if there's anything you've you've kind of learned from the discussion from other perspectives what you'd draw out of it and 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 throw forward and i know there's another one of these sessions planned for post cop and and and, and perhaps put yourself in in your shoes uh, I don't know who they'll ask us back, who will ask be back, ask back, but uh, whoever it is, put yourself in the shoes of a panelist or a moderator or whatever, ask back on November the twenty fifth, and 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 kind of what you'd, what you'd hope to see and be talking about at at, at that point. Um, let, let let's just, uh, Paul, you you were the, the the previous speaker, so I'm going to go, um, I think first to um, Jeevan. Um, if you even give us a minute or two to sum up your perspective, how you feel things have gone, what you're looking forward to. Thanks, David. So I'm um, just on, on food, which is our, our focus. I mean, I guess the sort of two, um, you, we spoke at the beginning about radical change. And I think the sort of two areas in which, um, uh, you know, we feel that we as a society need some kind of radical change are firstly with the consumers to think about kind of what we eat and how to drive some kind of systemic change across what we eat in a far greater mix of proteins uh, and putting much less of a burden on um, uh, foods like chicken, uh, which have such a kind of high sort of uh, demand on the environment. Uh, and the other area, the other sector where we need, really need to kind of think about um, changes on is from retailers because they have such enormous power in this country, the supermarket particular uh, and thinking about what they, they can do to eliminate soy from their supply chains. Um, but there's, there's also an observation I want to make um, really about the whole discussion tonight, um, which is, um, uh, and it is, uh, it's, it's a thought rather than a conclusion. It's just that, you know, it's incredibly gloomy, isn't it? We've had, you know, these cities of rubbish and, you know, these sort of projections of sort of disaster, really. Mm. Um, so there's a really big challenge, I think, um, in front of politicians and in front of journalists and in front of everybody else who's interested in the national conversation. Uh, at COP to think about how to make this urgent, um, how to give people a sense of mission, how to make people feel optimistic about some of the changes okay. that are going to be needed, okay. because we do need radical change, we need to sell it to people. Absolutely. Um, Will, I saw you, you, you'd left the frame, but you're now back. Uh, uh, give us a minute or two, I see the clock is ticking, um, and maybe picking up Jeevan's point about is there anything to be optimistic about? Well, I, th I, I think one, one of the things I th um, to think about is that you know we we've we've gone through the kind of 
part of well, a bit of a transition. So we've got out of coal, obviously, and we've done the coal gas switch. And you know, we've got to look to when we're discussing in COP with you know, uh, you know places like China, India, Southeast Asia, etc. I think that's that's kind of you know, my, you know, what they probably need to go through first, and then you go through the you know, they they can also do a bit the transition of renewables. I, I think at the same time, whereas we've kind of done it sequentially. So I think. We, it's a big ask actually to make of the other you know, regions of the world to you know do do several things at once so uh, I, but I, I do you know I, you know I hope and sense that there is a bit of a recognition recognition in uh, across the rest of the world and the US as well by the way sorry um, that you know we've got to kind of show we, we've we've gone not particularly fast but we've gone faster than quite a lot of other areas and i hope to some degree we can sh a bit show the show the way in terms of you know how our different technologies will be applied and i think you know what we what we in actually the eu as well are trying to do is to show demonstrate you know that it's feasible to decarbonize without completely you know um, damaging you know the economy standard so if we show it we try and do it and it's not successful then they won't you know quite got frank it. so got it got it okay uh G georgia um a final minute uh what you're looking forward to oh, oh gosh right well i'm i'm going to be there i'm a a, a cop pass holder okay. so it's my first cop i'm quite excited to be there and see it although i have to say i have quite low hopes <laughs> about what's actually going to be achieved there yeah. sadly um what i want to see what i want to see at cop so i've been campaigning with an amazing group of women called she changes climate to try and get greater diversity at the top table and i feel like we cannot continue talking about global solutions with a very small um Moggy is decided, and I feel like we need more diversity. We need to really properly include those from the global south, and we need proper gender diversity as well. And that fundamentally would change the conversation, I believe. We're not even succeeding in that. So I think that, that would be a really great thing to see going forward. So I'd like to see in COP27 that we have a female um, lead in you know, climate champion. Uh, that's one key thing. The other thing I think about is we talk a lot about energy sources. I would like to see a lot more talk about resource efficiency mm. because we are using a lot of stuff. We're producing a lot of waste. The resources that we have should be staying in the ground and we should be seeing our cities as mines, as places where we should be reusing all the stuff that we've already created. So I'd like to see mandatory um, you know, things like uh, insulation of buildings, much better energy efficiency of, of new buildings, of existing building stock. You know, there was a, the Green Homes grant. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. I think, I Stop think me. you've done, you've, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, talk but, forever. <laughs> I, we, we, we all, we all can, and it's fascinating yeah. stuff, but I, I, I want to give uh, two more panellists a quick, <laughs> a quick final shot. Shailaja, uh, look, cast ahead. Um, so what I really like to see the conversation about waste coming in through new waste infrastructure investments. We really need to think about this as it can't be a throwaway. A circular economy will not function unless we do that. And in particular, I'd like to link it to the point that Jeevan made. Eat smart, throw away less. And when we throw away, we monitor it. We're a country that prides itself on gardens. If we can make the breast topsoil, we should... Okay, thank you, Paul. You uh, you kicked us off. Um, just g give us a final thought on on. I guess well, let's just do this. Let's pick pick up a point that Jeevan made. What would cheer you up uh, if it happened at COP twenty six? Well, I, I mean, the, the I'm not saying you're gloomy. I'm, I'm just no, no, wondering what there's, would there's, inspire you. I'm I'm actually angry because we <laughs> okay. because we know what to do. We actually know what to do. We've, I mean, that's one thing we have learned over the last 20 or 30 years is what to do. Um, and what we are not willing to do is make the desirable and the sustainable economically possible. And we don't do that by not using pricing mechanisms, anything like enough. A paper I published last year showed that the average global carbon price is negative. The average, so let me tell you that as we come into COP26, the average global carbon price is negative. 
because of the subsidies to fossil fuels in many countries that still exist. Um, so we can't be, we can't even pretend that we're taking climate change seriously under circumstances like that. And those those fascinating comments in the in the questions there, you know, about can capitalism cope with this stuff? Uh, obviously, totally free market capitalism cannot, because we've got to get these issues into pricing, and we will need much more regulation than we've had in the past. We don't even bother in this country to see that the houses we built are built according to the regulations that are in in practice, with the result that they're not. So that all the new houses we've got are much less energy efficient than they should be, and they will need to be refurbished and re retrofitted in order to be fit for purpose. So we need more regulation in order to get this going, and we need prices that will push the economy in the right direction. Under those circumstances, we can do it. But okay. unfortunately, we're still a long way from implementing that. Paul, thank you very much indeed. Look, we're right on uh, 8.30. I think uh, uh, Luke and Pranvera said we needed to end on the nail. It's been fascinating. I mean, huge thanks to, to all of you, uh, to everyone who sent in questions, everyone who's been listening. Look, uh, there's Luke applauding, which is a very good sign uh, and happy, a happy organiser. Uh, I've, I've taken copious notes. I'll be at COP. Um, I'll be chasing up some of your stories. Uh, a huge thanks to the organisers, uh, to all our panellists, to, to the audience. Um, and uh, well, let's, let's, let's regroup and see where we go uh, in a month's time or so. Thank you all very much indeed. All right. Take care. Enjoy the Thank rest you. of your evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.